This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend, Shep Gordon, music managerial legend, worked with people such as Kenny Loggins, Alice Cooper, guy from Detroit, got to appreciate that. He's worked with many, many famous artists, Teddy Pendergrass. I remember a biography of Teddy Pendergrass and a documentary that explained your role in the transformation of his life, Shep. And, uh, but Shep, Shep is a person that I've known for many years. The ocean, the music, sensitivity to politics and society, a sense of generosity. He's always been inspiring. So I wanted to get together today, especially around a very profound development in this last nine months. Shep has become a father. He's got a son named Benjamin. And we've been celebrating that since he shared with that with me. But uh, let's talk at first. What is it like to be in the middle of a pandemic, bringing a new young boy into this world and managing the feelings of the pandemic with the joy of fatherhood? The combination of the pandemic and being part of this miracle. Um, brought me to places that I, you know, during the, I'm 75, and during the 75 years of my life I've touched on, but realized I couldn't, I couldn't answer the questions and moved on. During the pandemic, um, seeing this miracle in front of me um, and having a lot of time on my hands, not being able to do what I normally do, um, led me to a whole different set of questions. Um, you know, I, I, I've spent my life facing problems and challenges and working to solve those problems and challenges. Um, I, the last 20 years of my life, poverty has been a problem on our planet that um, has hit me hard. And there's practical ways to help solve that problem. I support the Maui Food Bank. I give away food drives. You can, uh, you can do things that affect the course of the problems on the planet. The pandemic and having the child led me to a whole other corner of questions, which is, why are we here? Like, what are we doing here? What effect do we, can we have, or do we have on why we're here? Um, how do you overcome the fear of not knowing why you're here, which is the ultimate question. Um, and I think in many ways leads to an understanding of how that our purpose is to be part of an integrated system, not to own the system. If we were supposed to own the system, we would have the tools we would have been given by whoever created this thing, the tools to own the system. Instead, when you get far enough away from the planet, the virus is the same as we are. The virus has relatives. The virus has a life cycle. The virus wants to thrive and live. Same as our species does. I think um, it really opens up huge questions that, that I would hope would lead to some equalization of the world, both in terms of supplies, um, thoughts. Um, I, I don't know. I, I know that it's questions I can never answer, which is really bizarre for me as a guy who solved problems. But I think even having those questions can help to make it a better planet. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the, the, the Dalai Lama, I remember one time his advice to the audience was the last thing to ever do is follow or listen to me because I don't know anything either. None of us really know anything. Um, you have to find your path and that can be very scary. I have found myself for the first time really in my life having some depression during this pandemic. I went through a period of three or four weeks where I could not control my mind. 
my mind took over and put me into weird places um, mm-hmm. until I realized until I realized it was fear I couldn't gave me a real sympathy for mental illness because I I couldn't control my thoughts yes yes and it and it bled into other places in my body my blood pressure went up um, I was having trouble sleeping I thought maybe I was having a heart problem um, and once I realized it was fear I was able to bring it down but but it, it brought up so many issues that I've never had to deal with before um, and hopefully they lead uh, and I'm sure we're all dealing with issues we've never had to deal with before um, so hopefully yes. we can make this yes. thing into something positive and maybe maybe get an understanding that we aren't any different than our brothers and sisters and that we you know the, the little things we can do are like make the air cleaner so we can all breathe and do what we're supposed to do here um, make food and water available to everybody because um, every every one of the species has in common that they have to eat something um, we all basically live the same cycle so I, I guess I've turned from prag, 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 pragmatic to philosopher in a lot of my things because I've realized that I won't be able to look in someone's face and say here's how you, how you get from point A to B but I can say don't worry about it just do the right thing and um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you'll never know the answer be comfortable in the embrace the not knowing and the, yes. and the miracle of it just like my baby I will never understand how he started to crawl or how he took his first bite or how he knew to open his eyes but instead of worrying in the fear of not knowing it I now embrace the miracle of not knowing it um, I hope that yes. makes some sense um, there's an old famous uh, book in psychology called feel the fear and doing it anyway yeah, and, uh, yeah. and I'm, I'm very embrace much it. Yes, exactly. Embracing. And uh, this is someone like Pema Children with her book, uh, When Things Fall Apart, is about, how would I say, the humility of not being able to control. Uh-huh. Yeah. The question of dreams. James Hillman's written Dreams in the Underworld. When I used to make blues music, I used to ask myself where do these artists find what's what's the groundswell of their creativity what's the context from which their art emerges and you can't know yeah no. but you know there's something right, right. and yeah there's uh, a certain secrets that you just never know i um, mean you yeah. have to embrace that yeah um, kind of but uh, it's but it's difficult i, I mean I'm, I'm not making light of it it's no, difficult. I no, still, no. I'm still challenged yeah, yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, now you had talked folks... about uh, the, I always say, the the nourishment that comes from practicing the culinary arts, and mm-hmm. you talked about that is almost when in our previous discussion uh, before the podcast, as is almost therapeutic. And I remember yeah. learning when you were the, you used to show me things about your excitement about cooking in your kitchen. And then I remember you went on tour through North America as the chef for Dalai Lama. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, but to share, share with us how cooking can be healing. How, how do you see, yeah, for, you how know, do you I experience think, that? You know, it, I guess it, it's, it's a long journey that I'll make very short, which is, um, yeah. When I was a younger person, I ran across Joseph Campbell. And one of the things he said is to find happiness, go to a quiet space for 30 minutes a day and find out what makes you happy and do it. Mm. So, for, so for years, I used to go into a room and try and find out, you know, I'd play music or I'd read a book or I'd um, do something, try and meditate. and Although I, I understood it in my brain, I didn't feel it in my body. 
And then I was lucky enough to um, get met. Uh, I, I met a, a man who mentored me who happened to be a chef. So because he was a chef, I started cooking. I had never cared about the culinary arts. I was a macaroni and ketchup guy. Um, <laughs> and once I started cooking, the Joseph Campbell light bulb went off. I found that if I be at the stove for a half an hour, when I left the stove, my mind was clear. My neck wasn't tight. Um, I had a lightness about me that was really beautiful. And I, so I investigated it more deeply and more deeply and really found after a couple of years of that, I had found my happy place. I had found my quiet room. I had found my place that I could go to and get happy because mm -hmm. getting happy is work. You don't just wake up in the morning and poof, you're happy. You're happy. Every, everything's work. Um, and so once I found that, I wanted to embrace it, hold it, keep it. And when the pandemic happened, I started to think about what do I do that really makes me happy? Because now I have time. I have more time than I've ever had. I have a brain that, I, that needs to do something, a body. And I said, culinary arts, let me really try. What have you always wanted to do, Chef? One of the things I always wanted to do was cook Chinese food. I love Chinese food. There's no Chinese restaurants on Maui. So I oh. put a wok in, a big wok, like in the takeout Chinese restaurants. <laughs> um, and I cook Chinese food. And I watch videos of people cooking. Like I love Masterclass. Um, all those, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, all the chefs cooking. Um, nice. And I find that that really relaxes me. I think, you know, if you can get lucky enough in life to find something that makes you happy it could be knitting it could be baseball it could be whatever it is but if you can find something that makes you happy hold on to it as tight as you can and don't let it go yes yeah so. and you've had a a very um, powerful role in the culinary world with people like wolfgang puck you and my mutual friend drew Neporn. Yeah. you and i've had dinners together at Nobu's on different parts of the planet. And uh, you know I know uh, I, Emerald and there, there's there are just a lot of people who I guess have experienced your value in the culinary world. So in addition to growing it in yourself, and I know it's the pandemic, you've gone out and elevated some of these other people who had these gifts. I felt the, A, I felt a great sense of debt. Um, to the culinary world for having given me this path. I think probably, you know, if you're a meditator, you're a teacher of meditation, you, you yeah. adore and want to help. So what I realized is that um, back in the 80s, they were considered cooks. They weren't artists. It wasn't mm -hmm. like Bob Dylan was a musical artist. You wouldn't say Emerald was a culinary artist. You'd say Emerald was a cook. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, I saw that they weren't getting respect, they weren't getting paid, they had no upside. And my skill set was taking artists and making them famous, wealthy, respected. And they're artists just like musical artists. So for me, it was very simple. Um, let's build a highway that gets you the same access to an audience that a musician has today. If, my, if, if there weren't record players, radio stations, um, discos, Michael Jackson would be a wandering minstrel. That's what mm -hmm. the chefs were. They only yeah. could touch their audience in the room that they were in. So, And you I, were involved in the formation of the Food Network, were you not? So I put all the chefs together and I said, let's get yeah. broadcast. We got the Food Network on the air. Let's get products in the stores. Let's get you out on tour. Let's allow you, the audience, to touch you in ways other than coming to your restaurant or else you're never gonna have an audience over a hundred people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I put together about maybe a hundred of the world's great chefs and we started an agency and uh, got the food network going and luckily the rest is history. Um, and, uh, and now I think it's, it's an accepted part of the fabric. Nobody talks about um, Thomas Keller. Oh, he's a cook down the street. It's Thomas <laughs> Keller. Yeah. You know, 
that it, it's, yeah. it, it would be like saying, oh, the folk singer playing at the Cafe of Go-Go. They don't say that anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, so it was a nice yeah, and, and, yeah. So, So in some respects, what you might call the improvisational learning tour that you did related to musical artists was then adapted. Same exact to this thing. to this place where your gratitude mm-hmm. for the core of what they do had been uh, created, which you might call through that Joseph Campbell like insight. Yeah, yeah, I, I did That's the great. business pro. I, my whole business was pro bono. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to pay them back for they had, they had allowed me to find my happy place, and. Um, that's that's what life's all about, you know. You get lucky enough to find a happy place. So, um, it, it it was very gratifying, and um, I think uh, it's been a beautiful circle. That's good. That's lovely. Grat- gratitude. I uh, made a big transition in my life when I left the financial industry, and a gentleman named John O'Neill had written a book I'd read called The Paradox of Success. Mm, And one of his ways out of paradox was gratitude. That you can take what you might call the surplus or what it is that you've created in one phase and direct that surplus to something that you think has deep meaning out of gratitude. And he wrote a book with uh, a gentleman who was the... uh, I can't believe uh, he was he was at the Grace Cathedral and they wrote a book called Seasons of Grace about the right. evolution of gratitude as the nourishment and propulsion of a meaningful life. And yeah. uh, and you you just exhibited that in this conversation. I think that's really Yeah, I I found uh, you know for me I I had a I had a transform I had a transformational moment. Um I was a young man um, and um, I was way too successful. I was living in a in what I would call now a fool's gold kind of world. I was driving my white Bentley, and I married a playmate who was a wonderful girl. I was wearing weird jewelry, coke rings around my neck. You know, it was I was a, I was a product of that time. And um, but I wasn't happy. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Um, mm. my knee, my knee was jumping when I had an important meeting. I was not comfortable in my skin, but I was hour by hour, very happy, very successful, but knowing that I was going to hit a wall, this was not a yeah. healthy pass. And around yeah. me, everybody was dying. Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morris, yes. everybody dying. Yeah. And these and, are people you knew. This is not just... You know, yeah, reading oh, no, Rolling Stone. You knew these people. I remember. And, and I knew I was headed to a problem, but I didn't know how to get out of it. Mm-hmm. And um, I it was 1977 or 78. I think I did my first movie and I won the Cannes Film Festival. And I got taken to a restaurant in the mountains of uh, Cannes called Moulin de Nijon. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And in the room was Anthony Quinn, and everybody, James Coburn, Barbara Streisand, Pavarotti. Um, nobody looking at the people at their table. Everybody looking around the room to see who was there. Everybody smoking, knees shaking everywhere, sweat pouring. <laughs> and I, I was in my group. I was in my, and that's who I thought I wanted to be. And then into the room walked this older gentleman dressed in white, gray hair. The room got silent. And Anthony Quinn jumped up, Coburn jumped up. They all jumped up to say hello and hug him. And obviously he was the power guy. Obviously the chef who was dressed in whites and had a beautiful face. And you could see just so comfortable in his skin. And I was, I've always been drawn to power. I've always found it curious. Uh, Mm -hmm. and and I said you know how did I want to be that guy I don't want to be the the nervous guy I want to be him so I waited till service was over Um, Paramount Pictures had taken me up I sent them home and I went over to him and I said "Um, 
could I be your grasshopper? And um, <laughs> there was a TV show, Kung Fu, and he had no yep, idea what I, I was remember. talking about. <laughs> but not to make the story too long, but the next year he allowed me to come and, and be his grasshopper. He was very kind. And wow. what I learned, wow. what, what that journey taught me was service makes you happy. You can yes. use the word gratitude, service. And then when I had the, yes. and so that started me on my journey. And then I had a, a, a moment with him that really reinforced it. We went to a restaurant, a new restaurant. Neither of us known that what we wanted to go to was closed. The food came. He finished his plate. I thought it was not good at all. He took my plate and finished it. And when we went outside, I said, Mr. Berger, um, please tell me why you ate two plates. I thought it was horrible. And he said, oh, chef, it was horrible. Not just horrible, it was horrible. I said, well, why did you finish the two plates? And he said, because I didn't wake up this morning to ruin the chef's day. He knew who I was. If those plates had come back with food on them, I would have ruined his day. I can take an upset stomach. I can't take ruining someone's day. Wow. And it was like wow. this light bulb went off of service and gratitude. And who you put first is probably the most selfish thing you can do by being. He made himself so happy by doing that. It was so selfish in some way. Um, yeah. Because that's what made him happy. And then when I met His Holiness, it was exactly the same bell. It was service, 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 service. Um, and gratitude and service go hand in hand. And that, I think as you get older, you look around the world and you see the people who have lived in a light of, of service or may not have the biggest car, may not have the biggest house, may not have the best wine cellar, but they're happier. So it really it depends what's important to you. I feel like I want to take this podcast and share it with the audience of Tony Robbins. Because I always hear these stories. He was very influential in the, with some of the financial leaders in the neighborhood where I lived in Connecticut for years. And his sensibility was always, I do this to create money to feed people. Or I, I do this to show you that being of service, finding your true self and what is valuable is, is the key to a meaningful life. And I, I would hear these tales from these guys who were like myself, financial speculators, but it was always that going deeper right. and trying to find that place that was, in, to use a silly term, it's a win-win game. It's a you're win, of win, service, win. and you're an, and you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, and, I gave a and, uh, I gave I gave a speech at the Culinary Institute of America to the graduates, and uh, I said, you know, when you guys graduate, you're going to probably go into eighty five hundred thousand dollar jobs. You're going to be serving meals that cost two hundred dollars. Your job's going to be to lock up the restaurant at night. That's going to be one of your things as a young kid coming in. When you lock up the restaurant at midnight and you walk outside, to the left and to the right are going to be hungry people. So you can see those hungry people because it's the right thing to do and it'll make you happy and will make your life meaningful. Or you can feed them because if you don't, they're going to break the glass, steal everything in the restaurant, and you're going to lose your job. So either way, you're going to get to the same place. Do it out of service <laughs> to make make yourself happy, <laughs> uh, and that and that is a big part of where we are today in the world. I was going to say, you know, it's really, yeah. it's it's it it's a statement that twenty years ago may have been funny, but today, particularly through the pandemic, is is real. If you're not of service and gratitude, and thinking about other people, hungry people do weird stuff, and you can't blame yes. them. Um, That's right. So, you know, we're, we're at a point where not only is it win-win, but if you don't do it, it's lose-lose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it could have been win and lose. I don't think that exists yeah. anymore. Um, 
But we clearly appear to be at a very unsustainable place socially. Yeah. And I know yeah. your professional career included that window of time yeah. where the counterculture and the civil rights movements and the violence in the political conventions, the rise of the Black Panthers, many of the things we're visiting in the film world right now right. with the Chicago 7 trial and so forth. But in that, in that discord is a very interesting challenge because when something is wrong, there are often many people who empathize with the cause but when the cause becomes abrupt and violent, they actually, which you might call, pull back and join the establishment out of their own fear right. and desire for stability. Yeah. And I, what I always found beautiful about the arts and particularly the kind of music that you worked with was this ability to create a healing feeling and acknowledge the discord. So you were being truthful, but you were yearning to be constructive yeah. at the same time. And I read recently an essay where James Baldwin was very concerned after Martin Luther King died because the problem of the rise of Stokely Carmichael and others who were friends of Baldwin's he understood their frustration, but your frustration cannot dictate your strategy going forward, or you may provoke that counter reaction. No. And Baldwin was corresponding with his brother David talking about this. It's I'm, so I, I want to, I guess, because of your experience in the arts, if you were right now, and you probably are, coaching leading musical artists on how to make a difference through their practice, what would you, what would you be suggesting? Um, you know, I, I, I think a big, a big part of it is consciousness. Um, I don't know how strong their voices are anymore. I think a big, huge part is the ability to raise funds for the people who can really do things um, to take specific things like poverty, um, like education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and raise funds to help the people who really are trying to do it. Um, I think um, we're living in such an upside down world now. It's so upside down that um, I don't know what I. I don't know who the messenger gets to anymore, and mm -hmm. how you get through to someone who cares. I mean, it, it was just a phenomenon in country music, which I make. I don't want to make any political statement on, but as a reality statement, there was a country artist who was fairly well known, but it never had a top ten record who was caught on YouTube using the N-word. This is about three weeks ago. And the next day, every radio station in America dropped his record. Um, stores sent the records back. But you know what happened simultaneously to that? The same day that the radio station dropped the record, he had the number one, two, three, four, and five top singles on iTunes. Still to this day, and went to his album went to number one. His old album went to number two. Mm -hmm. So, and there's been a lot of records that have come out that have talked about solving problems. They're not going to number one, two, three, four, and five. So I don't know who the audience is anymore. I, yeah, and I don't know what the messaging is. So I think my my advice to the artists who call me and ask me what can they do because everybody's trouble everybody wants to do stuff my advice is get into your neighborhood where you live where you have neighbors and see what's needed 
There's going to be a food bank your neighbors can need. There's going to be schools that need support. Buy the masks for the teachers. Go. You want to do something? Do something for your community where you can look in the eyeballs of people and change their lives for the better. Because right now at this moment, the big stuff, I don't know how you message it. It's all so confusing and so angry and so media driven and so nasty um, that I, I, I think sometimes to solve the biggest problems, turn it, look at the littlest part of it, look at where you can actually make an effect. So that's what I've been trying to do with when artists call me is forget about the planet for a second and get your community together, you know, work on, work on clean air in your community, work on good water in your community, work on education in your community for your neighbors. Um, and, and maybe that can start. It's, it's like the school garden started at one school in Harlem. And now it's like Johnny Appleseed, that school gardens all over the country, mm-hmm. make a statement, you know, let, let make, make a real statement. Um, what Alice has done is open a center where kids can go safely and get music lessons, get dance lessons, get back to some kind of a life. They schedule one kid at a time in each little studio. They go through testing. Um, just do something to help a human being in your community. Um, you were talking about Alice, life. Alice Cooper in this. Yes, yeah, Alice Cooper, uh, yeah. Because when, when you talk about food, I think of Alice Waters yeah, and her sorry, slow, yeah, slow yeah. food movement. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, you know, for me, I, I choose the Maui Food Bank because um, I live yeah. in Maui. Um, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, and I, I do some mentoring at the schools. And um, I've really, I, I've, I'm having trouble dealing with global issues because they have to go through so many levels of bureaucracy and politicians who we've now seen are, they're so far past corrupt. Corrupt would be okay at this point. They're so far past corrupt that it's, it's I, I just don't see, uh, I, I don't see any, any service, any gratitude in any of our leaders. Um, it's me, 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 me. So, um, and I hope I'm wrong. So for yeah. me personally, I know we have huge problems. Um, for me personally, it's, I think I can be helpful helping a human being in a local situation actually get some help rather than conversation. Yeah. I'm r- grinning inside right now because as you, I think, recall, my, one of my mentors as a high school student was John Sinclair. And John wrote a essay called Motor, Motor City Music in a book that he co-edited called Music and Politics. And what he basically said was there was a mystery in his life, which was when he was around Detroit, there was this harder music, Iggy and the Stooges, MC5, which he managed and so forth. But as he went to jail and if he'd smoke a joint, somebody was ready to lock him up. Yeah, yeah. And he said, well, one time he was in San Francisco and he was standing there and somebody was smoking a joint and the policeman came up and said, can I have a toke too? <laughs> and he described how much softer and more beautiful the music in San Francisco was than that it was uh, in Detroit, but both absolutely. were real. Yeah, but then he absolutely. said what frightened him and I'm going to tie this back to your local versus global, is he said what frightened him was that the music business was now not a local business. It was being guided, not just in distribution, but in the tactics of production by things that will sell on a national market. And it was becoming disembodied from that what you might call descriptive role or painting that artistic picture of real things and real feelings. And he was concerned about the future of music and the future of the arts. And as I listen to you talking about that, I'm also thinking about political economy, where there are times when we feel like at the local level, 
Even a well-meaning local politician can't control all the crosswash in a global economy that affects his, his or her constituents. But at the global level, like you said, there's so many layers and connect. You can't even be sensitive to what the local people need and you don't know how to deliver it to them anyway. Right. And so I, I feel like these dilemmas you're describing are part of those things you said at the outset are the unsolvable, yeah, yeah. unknowable questions. And what frightens me about the, your story of the music and iTunes and what goes to the top is let's just, I'll use a psychologist's analogy. There's a left brain and a right brain. And the left brain locks on and gives you a feeling of comfort because structures and ideas and things and ways to behave and so forth that have always worked. Trust in expertise, trust in government, knowing how the bank's going to save your money for you, all that stuff fortifies your trust. But when the system starts to break down, that right side, that intuitive side, senses that things aren't going right. And a fear is ignited. And then things are in play. Because the person who is dogmatic with authoritarian speech, or the person who creates arts that feeds that fear and paranoia can succeed. The left brain side can't be orderly and the right brain side that creates a more loving and hopeful music is not addressing the fear that's overwhelmed your spirit. Right. And how the artist can dig through that, I think is a, is a dreadfully difficult challenge. Difficult, really difficult. Just thought John Sinclair for a second. I don't know if you knew, but I picked him up from jail one year and brought him. To, <laughs> I brought him. Alice was playing at um, Cobo Hall. Oh yeah. Wow. And I brought him from jail to Cobo Hall, and he introduced Alice on stage, and the place oh, went did. wild, like <laughs> wild, straight from jail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, was I had an amazing a... guy, way ahead of his yeah. time. Yeah, still is. I, I had the yeah. good fortune of making a documentary film about his uh, life called From 20 to Life. It was it some out? of the, it, it's out, yeah, some of the stuff oh, that John it. and Yoko it's had uh, had uh, shot, but then because of their fear of exportation, Steve Gephardt, their filmmaker, was unable uh -huh. to crystallize. I got involved because I knew John and Steve and we finished the film. I'll, I'll, I'll oh, get you a well. copy. That's but great. he, yeah. uh, but John, John really is, even now, someone. You go back and you read his book, Guitar oh. Army. Yeah, remarkable the, guy. The appendix to that book, of political readings, musical, film, and other recommendations, is what I would call the counterculture curriculum for young people of of my era, and mm -hmm. uh, he really was was and continues to be quite prescient and. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and how would I say, say help, help stir the drink? Please say hello. If you talk to him. Oh, certainly will. Certainly will. We just used Alice Cooper, just used Wayne Kramer. We had Wayne uh -huh. open. The last shows we did in England, Wayne Kramer opened. And wow. he just played on Wayne Kramer from the MC5. Yeah. For yeah. our listeners yeah, who don't. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just try to keep everything linked up. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How would I say somebody that runs as wide and as fast as you do? I try to I try to create a little <laughs> assist there, but uh, but I, I I look at I look at now the role of the arts. I look at things like this Dylan song of last year, "Murder Most Foul," and others striving to, in some sense, identify that we have been on this unstable trajectory for quite some time. It obviously yeah. with the climax of the pandemic, George Floyd's murder, a lot of things have come to a head and the recognition is now widespread. But throughout your career, from the time you met Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin as a kid from Buffalo, all the way forward, we, things have been unfolding, not in a linear way, but they've been unfolding in a direction that wasn't taking much advice from what I would call the ministers of gratitude. 
right. about That's what true. purpose is. It, yeah. it really wasn't there. No. Well, it's, it, you know, music is a reflection of our times. And, um, yes. And um, it's really interesting. It's, it's um, I can remember, and, and it's a, and it's a, it's a statement of rebellion in its most powerful, uh, when it's most powerful, I believe, is when it's a, when it's a vomiting of rebellion. Um, those who songs all throughout time, mm -hmm. these generational songs, Bob Dylan, you know, mothers and fathers throughout this whole land don't criticize what you can't understand. It's always mm -hmm. been, th those have been the power. Times, they are and, changing. Yeah. And as we get older, I'm, I'm a 75 year old Jew. Um, as I got older, the music starts reflecting the rebellion against me. Mm -hmm. So rap music is talking about people like me. Um, mm -hmm. So I lose my connection to it because I don't want to beat myself up. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so it, it's a, it's, re, it's really, I think it's hard as a 75 year old to talk about the social impact of the new music because the social impact is so alien to what our lives are. Whereas it was our lives back in the fifties and sixties. But when mm -hmm. I listen to a rap song about, you know, everything with five, you know, N words and F words and null words and phlegm words. And I hate this person and I hate that person. We had flowers in our hands when we were protesting. We were protesting because we loved everybody. We love you and you won't love us back. Come wear mm -hmm. some flowers in your hair in San Francisco. Come, you know, um, now it's, you know, I want to kill you. Mm -hmm. um, Mother Black Pepper. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, as, as John Sinclair might interject, hate Ashbury and Detroit are very different places. Oh, very different places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the right. world you're is right. a very different. Yeah, and the world is a very different yep. place right now too. So, yes, um, I think. I mean, my my reflection on it, which may be completely off base because I don't live in that generation, is that their anger is so directed where our anger was directed at inequality in in social justice and mm -hmm. their theirs has a little bit of social justice but it's mostly material justice they want the car they want the chain they want the the girl mm -hmm. they want the mm -hmm. money they want the shoes they want the louis vuitton bag they want the yeah. um, you know for us we wanted everybody let out of jail and smoke a joint on the streets and raise your kids mm -hmm. naked and um so it's, it's yeah, just, you know, that yeah. but that's the beauty of art because it tells their story, which it should, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and not our story. We've told our story and we have a But one can ask story. the question, you know, with, how would I say, Joseph Campbell, who you cited, used to say that one of the challenges in life is going from the warrior to the wizard. Yep. In those later years, that wisdom might be invoked in a time like this, given what you just said, to ask whether they are worshiping a false god with the car and the shoes and the big house and all of that in relation to what you might say the uh, the path that led you to gratitude. Yeah. And hopefully they'll find and, that. And that's not necessarily... Uh, something that people of our generation has its fault lines and it's made mistakes and their oh, yeah. critique of that may be painful, but it's justified, but there may be ways when in the pain and turmoil of their lives, they get off course. And then the wisdom that you still have to offer, if you hide from those people who've criticized us, you're not given all the gifts that you could. Right. I, I agree. And, I, and I know it's hard. I feel it. Yeah. I feel it all the time. I feel it just like you described, but I think there is a sense in which perhaps the pandemic has a silver lining that it shakes so. us all up enough to know we don't know and to explore those senses of community 
and togetherness that you found so inspiring at an earlier time. And as my uh, grandmother would say, from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, Shep, tell me a little bit about the favorite movies that you made. I remember Kiss of the Spider Women, Koyana Scotsy, yeah. and some others, but, but what, what would, caught your fancy in film? You know, I, I just want to correct when I, when, when you say I made, um, I was, I was a, there are certain things in my life where I feel like I had my hands in the clay. And then yeah. there's other things in my life where I supported other people's visions. Right. And I right. supported their clay making. So in the film Fair. world, that's basically yeah. what I did was I supported the, I, I attempted to give filmmakers the freedom to mold the clay the way they wanted to mold it. You, you, that, that being, that being said, I think the things that I'm proudest of are um, El Norte, mm -hmm. which was um, the first movie to come out of Sundance. When Sundance first started, it was a laboratory. It wasn't a film festival. Mm -hmm. It was a laboratory for writers, directors, producers. And um, Gregory Navar and his wife, Anna, wrote this amazing script and directed this amazing movie about them. It starts off in South America with a young family looking at life magazine and in life magazine there's a picture of a flushing toilet and they're having a conversation about how everybody in the north has a flushing toilet they had never seen a flushing toilet and then it shows the journey of this brother and sister to get to california as illegal migrants uh, mm. and it, it's really powerful and tells a story that's so current today so I think that Koyana Scotsy, which um, was executive produced by Francis Ford Coppola, but was a vision of a Franciscan monk, um, Godfrey Reggio, who left the fatherhood to make this movie. Koyana Scotsy uh, means life out, of uh, life out of balance in Navajo. Right. And um, it's a, no actors, no dialogue. Um, it opened the New York Film Festival at Radio City Music Hall um, and really powerful. It, it, it should be seen on a big screen, but it's powerful. And then I'd say the, the third one for me was Wales of August, where the youngest person was 86 years old in the movie. Yeah. Lillian yeah. Gish in her 90s, Betty Davis in her 90s, Vincent Price in his late 80s, and Southern in her late 80s. Um, and I live in Maui on a... On a uh, beach where the whales come every year and that's a, a one of the things in the movie is waiting for the whales every year um wow. at, on the movie wow. so i i'm really proud of the movies i made because they were they were a human's statements unfiltered um there were no committees this is the time movies are usually made by committees they're a series of compromises um mm -hmm. and some of the things are so silly that go into them and, you know, you may not notice them when you see a movie, but you feel them. You know, I can, I can remember doing a big, a big movie at MGM called Endangered Species. And they had a, and excuse me, because I can't remember his name now, but they had a TV star, Robert, the nicest man in the world. Big, he had a TV series, good looking, leading man, but he couldn't get a leading role in a movie because he was a TV star. Mm -hmm. So MG, we, we had uncovered, and it was a phenomenon you might remember, Rob, back in the 60s, where they were finding mutilated cows all over Colorado. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew why. Mm -hmm. They found hundreds of mutilated cows. Um, we did an investigative reporter, and we found out that it was uh, germ warfare by the Army um, on these cows. So we went to tell the story, and they said they would finance it if we used their leading man from TV as the leading man. And the third day of shooting was a scene where he was in a swamp at night, had a helicopter over his head, like hovering 20 feet over his head. He's in a swamp completely covered in water with a bamboo um, straw so he could breathe. And they closed the film down because the part in his hair was messed up. And he's a leading man, and his hair has always <laughs> got to look right. 
and we had to reshoot Whoa. the scene. <laughs> we had to reshoot the scene with him in the swamp with the boom. When he came up, he had to have his hair perfect. Oh, so, my. so I enjoyed doing my movies because we never, my rules were I don't want the script. It's not my job, not my business. You know, make your movie. I'll protect you. I'll build a fence around you. Um, make your movie. So. Well, they made a movie about you that I should mention briefly to our audience called Super Mensch. Mike Myers uh, made. I remember joining you for a beautiful dinner in New York one evening. Uh, yeah. I think Alan Gruber was the uh, host. Alan Gruber, yeah. To That's talk right. about the film after it was released. That was a lovely experience. And, <laughs> and more importantly, that was a lovely movie to see I, how. I remember. The, I, you know, yeah, there's, just, certain mo there's, there's certain moments in your life you'll never forget. Yeah. And yeah. I had a moment with you that I will never forget. Now, I won't name any of the people because it's, uh, and hopefully they're not listening, but it's a moment that I go back to so many times. Um, Bernie, somebody, Bernie the financier had just taken everybody's money. Uh, Bernie hmm. Madoff. Bernie Madoff. Madoff. Had, Madoff. Right. Had, right. Had just found out that he stole everybody's money. You and I were having dinner with another couple. We the conversation was on everybody's lips about Madoff, and um, we were saying how horrible it was. And one person at the table said, "Man, what a stupid guy! Do you know that?" He had billions of dollars and his boat was only 125 feet long. Like, why would anybody <laughs> bother to get a boat 125 feet long when you have that much money? And I, I've never forgotten the entitlement of that line. <laughs> I, it just, I don't know why, but that moment, I don't remember the moment, but that moment stuck in my head. For the, it's been probably been 30, 20 years. Madoff went away, 15 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, it, 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 we were on the page of like, he stole money. What a horrible guy. And the other person was on the page of, I can't believe he had that much money and bought a small boat. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> uh, uh, was how would I say? There are a lot of cross currents in this culture. We got to, <laughs> how do you say, manage the wrinkles in our skin that come from all of that. My God. <laughs> and uh, well, one of the other times I enjoyed, and people would learn about this from Supermensch, uh, in was when you had adopted uh -huh. some children from the, of a former wife to raise yeah. at a time when my sailboat was in the area, exactly. and we yeah, got to go sailing. Here. I'm sorry, one of the kids. One of the kids is here, Amber. Oh, great. Who's wow. the one who set me up for the call today because I don't know how to set this stuff yeah. up. So oh, right, <laughs> right. And, uh, but that was a, a magnificent, magnificent experience, being with you yeah. sailing at the time when you were embracing yeah. that, beautiful, that beautiful mission. Yeah. And one of the yeah. things I wanted to ask you for our audience is I don't think it's a coincidence that you live in Maui. My parents had a, a condominium in Kauai that was destroyed by a hurricane in the early 80s. And my wife and I owe you a debt of gratitude because you helped us set up our honeymoon in Hana for the first half, yep. and then we went to Kauai for the second. Yep. But Hawaii has very spiritual, very magical elements. You talk about the whales. I remember just yeah. sitting in armchairs with you and your lawn talking about, was there any way to bring Sam Cooke's work to a broader yeah. audience? And, yeah. but, but what is it, what is it about Hawaii and what I are the know. spiritual I... teachings? What are the gods and goddesses or the parables that we should know to know more about that beautiful set of islands? You know, I, I, I came here at a complete innocence. I, I landed by boat, put one foot on the island. 46 years ago and said, I'm living here the rest of my life. It was just, I felt comfortable in my skin. I felt completely different in my skin. I never looked for a reason why to do it. I found the house that week. I still live in that house 46 years later. 
Um, and it's gotten better and better when I try and think why. I think of it as um, part of it, I think, is the innocence. It sort of got the innocence of a baby, which I always wanted. And now I have, and I really see the comparisons. <laughs> It'll be my baby will be happy as could be laughing, and then he'll cry for a second. Here it's sunny and beautiful, and then it'll rain for a minute. My baby smells like a baby. It's just the greatest smell. Maui smells like a baby. There's sweet flowers everywhere. The air is clean. You get these beautiful aromas coming. So it's got the, for me, it's sort of, I, I've always, I've always been attracted to power and I've always been attracted to innocence. And the combination of the two for me is, you know, that's my comfort zone, um, is power mm-hmm. and innocence. You know, I think if, if you can accomplish those two things in your life, um, you've, you've got a long way to helping yourself be happy. Um, so, and this has the innocence, but then it also has this unbelievable power. Uh, we have a volcano, Haleakala, um, yes. which is very powerful, has a lot of myths around it, a lot of history. It was, um, the, one of the gods was Haleakala. They say that, that he loved this island so much that he threw his anchor to the sun and he held the sun so that Maui gets more hour, more time of sunlight than anywhere else on the planet because yes. he held it for us. Um, so I don't know. It, it really wasn't a conscious decision. Um, and it, it, it really wasn't checkpoints. It just was, I got here, I put one foot on it, and I just said, I have found my home. And yeah. whether I convinced myself of it or whether it was a past life, or I, I don't know any of that. And uh, I know I, it's another one of those questions I'll never know an answer to. So I just embrace the, the joy of being here. Well, you had the good uh, sense. You know, you talked about power and innocence. And to, one of the things, I guess, the, you're illuminating something for me about you, which is to navigate through power and remain a sense of what matters and that tenderness mm-hmm. and that in- innocence does require yeah. a very, very dedicated sense of personality and a very powerful spirit. Mm-hmm. Because power and what they call the siren songs of temptation in the Odyssey go together. They go together. And being okay. able to use power in a constructive way being able to um, not get afraid of power so that you distance from it and lose all of the things that you could contribute Mm. to fostering the beauty and the innocence, staying in that place between power and innocence requires an enormously... Keeps you on your toes. Dedicated, (laughs) yeah, but, but you've got to be, you've got to go inward and create a sense of strength and a sense of purpose not to get got to get thrown around mm-hmm. in the cauldron between power and the yearning for in- innocence mm-hmm. yeah, so it, it's a it, it's a tight rope but but a good is. one but a good one well at, at a time like this ship i can't think of a better recipe than someone who's willing to wrestle with power in a constructive way, in service we need it. Yeah. of innocence we need. and beauty, and that's we what I people. think. That's what I think you model. And with like just in our exploration today, you've brought to the surface. I think there's a lesson for the young people at the Institute for New Economic Thinking contained in this conversation. I hope so. I didn't see it coming. We talk, we excavated it, but I think it's there. And I thank you for that.